was the month before Christmas, and all through this house, Canadians miffed Liberals quiet as a mouse. Taxpayers hung stockings by the chimney with care, with fear that the carbon tax soon would be there. The cabinet were nestled all smug in their beds, while visions of deficits danced in their heads. When out on the borders there arose such a clatter, PM says open the borders, what does it matter? <laughs> to the window the finance minister flew like a flash. He tore open the shutters and threw out more cash. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a ministerial sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver, could it be St. Nick? No, it was a little Jerry Butts. It was just a trick. With a sleigh full of handouts, in they came. Jerry whistled and shouted and called them by name. Oh, de on deficits, on spending, on with the fiscal mess, all of this contributing to Canadian stress. It was the night before Christmas. October 19 is near. We'll throw them out and replace them with Andrew Shearer. <laughs>that was pretty good you gotta admit that was pretty good hello everyone welcome back to just my stupid opinion today on the 16th of december 2018. Yeah, I literally saw that just before I went on, so I decided that uh, it was good enough that it deserved to have its own uh, little show at the beginning. And that also deserves a, a follow on Twitter, I might add. And speaking of Twitter, actually, because uh, this is something that happened to me just a few days ago. And it's that my account on Twitter has been permanently suspended. Uh, what ended up happening was, I think it was on Monday, I ended up, uh, no, sorry, it wasn't Monday, it was, uh, about Wednesday or so, it was about four days ago, I'm getting my days mixed up, I know it's Sunday today, but anyway, what ended up happening was that a video came into my news feed, and what it was, it was a really graphic video, a really terrible one, it was of... Whoever was holding the camera had two babies lying on the ground and was proceeding to abuse them. And I mean, he was slapping them. He picked one up and dropped on the ground. He choked the choked the, one of the babies to the point where you actually saw blood that was on the ground. I, and I have no time for any sort of child abuse in this way. So I commented on it and saying that if I knew who this was, I would murder them with my own hands. That, that was the tweet I ended up putting out. And then a few hours later, when I signed into my Twitter account, it t they said I got suspended. I wasn't sure at first. I thought it was that I was temporarily suspended, you know, 48 hours, a week, whatever. I appealed it, and it turns out that, no, I've been permanently suspended from Twitter for my account. So my account that I've been using since the beginning of my podcast is no longer there. So I've now linked, from now on in the videos, I will link be linking into the description the new Twitter account that I am using, just because uh, I still I, I find Twitter is useful for information, which is the main reason I got it. Uh, but you know, I I tried to start up a new one that was uh, dedicated to the JMSO podcast, and that one I wasn't even done filling out the description, and it already suspended me for circumventing permanent suspension rules on Twitter. So I I did. By their own de Twitter's definitions, I did break the rules because there's no threats or uh, violence that are allowed on Twitter. But I just, you know, for account for a platform that has allowed people to advocate for pedophilia, for an account that has allowed ISIS members to be on there trying to recruit people, I just thought it was a little ridiculous. But oh well, it is what it is. So I guess I'm starting from scratch. I actually had that account a little while ago. I started it up just as another anonymous account, but now I'm just going to link it to here, and that's what I'm going to use from now on. So uh, the, we're going to be. So the last thing also I want to talk about when it comes to social media is something that came to my attention about uh, YouTube. Actually, oh, oh, we don't need that anymore. And it was uh, so. This is again. I was just 
this is just some of your up your upload defaults and this is when i was changing around the twitter account that's connected to my account and it says here just at the top this blue bar here that caught my attention right before i i right before I moved on, it says, on December 13th and 14th, so a few days ago, you may no, uh, see a noticeable decrease in your subscribers counts as we remove spam from your channel. So YouTube is going on another censor spree right now, and I actually didn't notice it. I noticed that I lost a few subscribers. I gained um, I gained a fair amount because of the, the video that I put up from Parliament Hill. That one got me some, but I did notice that there was a decrease a little bit, not too much, but I just find it's a little ridiculous. I don't think that this is YouTube's job. I who if it, even if it's spam, and I mean I've I've gotten the spam too. I I had somebody that just recently was putting comments in my a bunch of different videos that was more or less the same thing actually. I can show you. Uh, yeah, you can see right here. So I, I wonder if this is why they were particularly, um, they partic were putting that on my channel about spam. And this is without a doubt spam, but I don't think that's YouTube's job in order to do that. I think it's the job of the individual creators in order to decide whether or not they want these accounts deleted or, or not, or ban the accounts themselves. So YouTube's, I think YouTube's using it as an excuse to go on another spree because we've seen it on Twitter, we've seen it on Facebook, we've seen it on YouTube, and plenty of other of these social media platforms where they, where they will remove uh, remove accounts from certain, um, they sorry they will remove subscribers from certain accounts, and it's supposed to be that they're cleaning house, but a lot of times it's been used to silence some people. I'm not high on the list, clearly. I mean, with only 660 some odd subscribers, I'm no way in YouTube's top, uh, one of the top people that they'd be targeting. But I've, I've noticed that over the years, it started out with big accounts. Then they started moving the way down to smaller and smaller and smaller accounts. And we're even seeing this on uh, Twitter right now. It's uh, putting my what happened to me aside. We've been seeing how for the f originally when Twitter was banning people, it had to do more with. Um, you know, it was supposed to be alt-right accounts and extreme accounts, but then they started moving, yeah, the average conservative is going to get targeted. Uh, you know what, now we're hitting the, the more centrist now, and this is exactly what's going on. It's going to continue. It's going to keep continuing until Twitter and all these platforms are nothing more than platforms for the far left. Even liberals at one point will be perceived as too far to the right for them. So this is just par for the course. That's all that's really going on. So... That's just me cleaning house. Uh, let's get into what we really want to talk about today. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about has to do with... Um, I wanted to go a little bit more into Agenda 2030, the UN Agenda 2030, and what are the details in there? Because the Combat for Migration applied to it, the Paris Climate Agreement, that was part of the, um, that was part of the Agenda 2030. So I think it's important if we go through, for those who haven't actually looked through the actual what is Agenda 2030 itself, then it's important that you see it and see what the what these definitions mean in their, I, think, I believe it's 17, a 17-point 17 plan for their sustainable development goals. So we're going to be talking about that. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about hi Quebec hypocrisy and how Quebec has, there seems to be one set of rules for Canadians and another set of rules for Quebec, the province. And then I also want to talk a little bit about um, Alberta separation because this is something that has been gaining steam over the last few months, especially with, I would say probably I started, started to see it again when Kinder Morgan Pipeline was killed. But then as everything has continued, as oil prices started dropping and that Alberta has felt that they have been that they have been cut off from the rest of the country, that they don't matter. I think this is a very important conversation to have. Why they're doing it and also why, they, uh, why they're doing it and also what would be the outcomes if they decided to separate. Um, so let's start off a little bit uh, with... You know what? Today I think we're going to start with this idea when it comes to Quebec. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Quebec. We're going to talk about the Alberta separation because, you know, we know about Quebec separatism in the past can apply into that. And then we're going to end off talking about the 2030 agenda. And once this is done, I'm going to put the time codes into the description about when this all starts. So if you're more interested in seeing the 2030 agenda, you can go check that out instead of just listening through the whole thing. So what really brought this to my attention was... Uh, 
I ended up, I was reading some articles on, from the Montreal Gazette, and there were two, two in particular articles that caught my attention, and I think it, it goes to show the double standards that are there under the Trudeau government for Quebec in comparison to the rest of Canada. And I'm not really going to read too much from the articles themselves, I just want to talk about them. So, uh, we're going to start first. This article right here is English community will fight on for school board despite Lego's mourning. Uh, the court ordered that minority language communities have a right to control and manage education facilities, QCGN president said. And the QCGN is the Quebec Community Group's network. So it says, which includes 60 uh, English language communities organization across Quebec. It says a statement on Friday that it absolutely no intention of heeding Premier uh, Francois Legault's advice to uh, give up because they will lose in court. So what this is doing is, and it's right in here, they say... Chambers was responding to a comment made by Legault in an interview on the Montreal Gazette Thursday. He argued that the English school boards decided to challenge his coalition Avenir Quebec government plan to transform Quebec's 72 school boards, including the nine English ones, into service centers they would be uh, into service centers they would be wasting their time. So pretty much what it's doing is it's going to be infringing on the right of the Anglophones inside of Quebec in order to support their own school, uh, have their, for the school board to support their schools so that way they would have to be moving along to provide more French curriculum and, like I said, infringing on the right for the, these Anglophones in order to teach what they want. Now, the way it works in all over Canada is that we have the school boards. You've got French school boards, you've got English school boards, you've got immersion school boards, which will teach both. And it is every right that both, because we have a dual language, official languages in Canada, that people should have that right to choose. Do they want their kids to go to an all English school or an all French school, or do they want them to learn both languages? I ended up going to an immersion school throughout my entire uh, life. So from kindergarten all the way to grade 12, I was learning French and Technically, I'm bilingual. I have my bilingual certificate, but I will admit that my French is a little rusty. It's not terrible, but there are words I get caught up on. Sometimes I need to uh, switch to English for a little bit just to get my point across. I stumble a little bit. So what I think is most important about this is what had to do in Ontario very recently. You remember how... Premier Doug Ford was getting a lot of flack because he was making cuts to certain school boards and also to French services in Canada, uh, in Ontario. In fact, we saw as one uh, one member of the Progressive Conservative Party cr ended up going independent because of this. She was outraged that this is what was going on. Well, many of you may not have known, but Ford actually rolled some of those cuts back because of the outrage they were happening, and Francophone Canadians all over Ontario were taken to the streets, protesting against this, trying to lobby the Ontario government in order to change their policy on this because they felt it was unfair. It was infringing on their rights to, in order to have French language schools taught to their children. So this ended up going on. But what a lot of people also probably didn't know about that was that the Quebec Premier, François Legault, also had a part to play in that. He actually ended up speaking to Doug Ford directly and saying how he needs to roll back these cuts that he's making because it's unfair for the French people in in Ontario. And we can see here that uh, from the Toronto Star, cuts to French language services hurts uh, services hurts us all. The Ford government's cuts to services from uh, for Franco Ontarians are more than just a profound disservice to the province's 620,000 francophones. So, and as I was stating, Francois Legault was one of the people that spoke to Ford saying that he should ro decide to change these. And I think Legault was actually trying to make sure that he didn't make the cuts at all, but Ford made the cuts anyway. And the thing is, too, is with what, what was going on, with what is going on in Ontario. Now, I'll admit when it comes to Doug Ford right now, I want to see more than just the cuts coming out of him. I want to see real change in Ontario, which I haven't seen yet so far. I mean, we do have the fact that he has, um, that he ended up pushing through his bill, uh, is it 37, I think? It was going to cut the size of Toronto City Council in half, which I was in favor for. I just don't like that there is the um, Section 33 of the Charter, which is the notwithstanding clause. I don't, I'm not really crazy about the notwithstanding clause and how that gives 
the Ontario government uh, or provincial governments the ability to infringe on the charter. Well, they free certain section of the charter. See, that was one of my problems when it came to him using the notwithstanding clause was the fact that people are saying, well, he's infringing on charter rights when in fact it is in the charter itself to give him the power in order to do so. So I want to see some more more action out of Doug Ford, but I know he has stiff competition out there. Right now, he's been having just about everything that he's done taken to court. So I want to see more in that. Uh, so I so I understand that he's under pressure, but I still want to see more coming out of him. But that being said, this is what ends up happening in this is what ended up happening in uh, Ontario. He received a lot of flack. He had to roll back some of these, and he even had an uh, MPP leave the Progressive Progressive Conservative Party because of it. And then about a month later, not even a month later, Premier Legault turns around and does the exact same thing in Quebec. See, this is something that they're, they're always talking about, the problems that Francophone uh, Canadians have across Canada and, like, you know, how they're having their problems with the Anglophones and getting their services in French. When it's the other way around, when it's in Quebec, it is completely fair. It is fine with them if they want to make these cuts to the Anglophone community. I remember a while ago, I read an article. It was years ago. And I'm, tr I'm trying to remember where I found it. I've really had trouble finding it ever since that day I read it. But what it was talking about was a small town in France, which uh, – in France – a small town in Quebec. This small town all the time was 50% Anglophone. Since its founding, it, it had more than 50% Anglophone people in there, which meant that they had to do bilingual services. Signs had to be both in French and English. They had to, whenever they went to a school, they had to offer French alternatives, things like this. This was what was going on. But what made the news, uh, what made the news was the fact that as time went on, this was probably back in about 2014, 2015, that now the population had reached more than 50% francophone. And because of that reason, because it was more than 50% francophone, they only had to put signs in French. Suddenly now, the idea of bilingualism didn't matter anymore. It didn't matter. Which, to me, seems like complete crap, because when it was one way, oh, you need to make sure you're offering the French people all these services. Now that we're mostly French, you Anglophones, you don't get the same benefit that you gave to us. And this is some of, some of my problems when it comes to Quebec, is the fact that when it comes to their language, and I've talked about before some of the problems that Quebecers do face, such as when people come over from Ontario, they tend to speak more English than French, but at the same time, many of the Francophones over there, if they even detect a hint of an English accent, they'll switch to English right away. If you have even stumbled a little bit on words, they just switch to English, and then they get really pissy with you about it. But it's also the little things that they do. I remember that one time when I went to uh, to Quebec, and like right now, most of you know, I'm smoking the, the vaporizer now. But I, of course, like most people who do it, I start off on cigarettes. I used to smoke Canadian classic cigarettes. That was one of my main brands. When I went over to Quebec, they're Quebec classic cigarettes. So it's just this, all this sort of anti-Canadian feel that comes out of Quebec. This, like, the idea that anything named Canada needs to be switched so it's got Quebec. If you've got English, it's got to be more in French. You've got to accommodate to the French people, but it's, the French people don't need to accommodate to the English ones very much. So this is just one example of Quebec, um, uh, the double standards that Quebec has. And it's not just underneath Justin Trudeau, but Justin Trudeau has given them more of benefits since he came in office. Don't forget that Justin Trudeau himself said that he felt that Quebecers were better than the rest of Canada. He also named a bunch of prime ministers from Quebec saying that they were the best prime ministers in all of Canada. Oh, you know, Pierre Trudeau, um, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, all these people, even though we I've already gone through in the past and shown how they were anything but. I mean, Pierre Trudeau has sold us out to the international bankers. He changed our banking system so that way we are in huge amounts of financial debt that we weren't in before he came into office. Uh, Jean Chrétien was corrupt. The millions of dollars were lost under him. Documents were lost. Uh, Paul Martin was so incompetent that he didn't even finish one term after Jean Chrétien was out and Paul Martin took over as prime minister, as the leader of the Liberal Party. He didn't even make it through one single term as the prime minister before there was a vote of non-confidence, and that's when Stephen Harper ended up coming in. You know you're freaking bad at your job when. 
So we've seen this already. But then what's even more recently is that Trudeau has given the veto power to the Quebec government when it comes to pipelines running through their um, running through their province, which is the problem if we want to start up an Energy East pipeline again, is the fact that Quebec's not going to allow it. In fact, they even came out just uh, over the last week where they said there will be no pipelines running through Quebec. And that brings us to our next piece of Quebec hypocrisy. This is also in a, something else that came out of the Montreal Gazette. And so Quebecers' energy choices compromise greenhouse gas goals, report says. Half of energy used in Quebec comes from renewable sources, but Quebecers are continuing to spend records amount on large automobiles and even larger homes. Uh, a report gauging Quebec use, uh, use of energy resources is warning that unless consumers trends in the province change, the province's target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions will not be met. So this goes on to talk about how um, it goes on to talk about how Quebecers actually use a lot of our of oil when it oil, fossil fuels, gas, things such as this in their own um, province. But this is the province that has been anti-pipeline. They want renewable sources. And don't get me wrong, they're using some renewable sources, as it even stated in this article. It says that about 50% of their energy comes from it. But then they're not toning down their living expenses. While at the same time, they are also... They are also responsible for a lot of jobs not making out to places like Newfoundland when you cancel Energy Eap pipeline that was going over to the Maritimes that pipeline is going over there where the the oil could then uh, the crude oil could then be refined the money the jobs stay in Canada the money stays in Canada but they killed this and Newfoundland has its own problems they are there's heavy unemployment out in Newfoundland and the jobs that are available aren't very good there are a lot of minimum wage jobs. There's a lot of people live on welfare because there's nothing out there. And now with uh, when they're trying to take control of the fishery industry, the problem with that too is now a lot of these people make their lives by fishing and they can't do this anymore. So I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more of a maritime separation from the rest of Canada. But much of this has to do with Quebec. And not only that, Quebec imports a bunch of oil as well. They import it from Saudi Arabia. They import it from other areas in the Middle East that have dictators, that have terrible tracks on human records, that have terrible tracks when it comes to environmentalism. But that doesn't stop them from doing that. Meanwhile, they're trying to kill the, uh, the tar sands over in Alberta. So they want, oh, and let's not forget that actually, they've already taken unprecedented, unprecedented amount of of equalization payments. Many people have been talking about how unfair the equalization payments is, and they're still taking their feet. In fact, just recently, they announced the government of Canada, I believe it was Bill Morneau, another French politician, has just announced that they're going to give an extra $1.4 billion to Quebec every single year in equalization payments. Ontario, we, we're not getting any of that anymore. We have in the past. Don't get me wrong. Ontario has taken its fee of the equalization payments. But just recently, I think it was actually over the last couple of days, it was announced that we are out of that now. We are now paying into the equalization payments. We are not receiving the equalization payments anymore. So we have that. But so... <laughs> This is why my problem, this is why I rage so much against Quebec, is that they pull this bullshit where they snub their nose at the rest of the country. Oh, we want to be a na recognized as a nation inside of a nation. We want a protective culture. We want a protective language. We demand that you make everything equal. But when it's time for reciprocate, they never do. They never do. And the problem is when it comes to equalization payments is you can guarantee that as soon as as soon as somebody comes in trying to revamp the equalization payments, that party, whoever it happens to be, is going to lose a shit ton of votes and a shit ton of, of ridings inside of Quebec for that very reason. This is one of the reasons that Justin Trudeau didn't want to revamp the, uh, the equalization payments earlier this year. It was because he he's already losing in a bunch of other provinces. I mean, it was catastrophic for the Liberal Party on what happened in Ontario when Doug Ford was voted in with his majority government, and he demolished a bunch of Liberal ridings in Ontario. So we see that the CAQ ended up coming into power, which is a right-wing party inside of Quebec. He's losing ground everywhere. If he revamped equalization payments, you can guarantee that he was not going to 
uh, you can guarantee that he was not going to win any ridings in Quebec or very little ridings in Quebec. They want to have their cake and eat it too. That's the problem with Quebec. Um, the other thing too is I just want to bring up is when we're talking about, uh, I actually kind of forgot to bring it up just a minute ago, but when we're talking about the idea of the language problem inside of Quebec and how they're cutting funding to the English school boards, trying to revamp them, uh, in the article by, by the Toronto Star, it ended up saying that there are 620,000 Francophone Ontario, Ontarians, I believe. I believe that was the number. Well, I decided, eh, you know what, let's go take a look at how many Anglophones are inside of Quebec right now. Now, don't get me wrong, it's going to be the same thing in Quebec, just opposite of what it is in Ontario. In Ontario, you're going to have mostly Anglophone speakers with some Francophones mixed in. In Quebec, you're going to have a bunch of Francophone speakers with some Anglophones mixed in. However, when we look at the number, and this is a census number from 2011, so we're talking about uh, seven years ago, almost eight years ago, so you can guarantee that number has changed. It's saying that there are just, just under 600,000 Anglophone speakers inside of Quebec, and that is 7.7% .7 of the population, but some of the numbers I've seen more recently have said about 9% of the population inside of Quebec is Anglophone at the moment. So... They have a, almost the same amount of Anglophones inside of Quebec as they do have Anglophones in, uh, as Francophones inside of Ontario. And remember how the Toronto Star was going off on Doug Ford about this, how unfair it is, how it hurts everybody. Well, the rest of the media has been pretty damn quiet right now when it comes to these changes that were made by, by Premier Legault in, uh, against the Anglophones inside of Quebec. It's two sides of the same coin. They might be a little bit different, the details, but the same thing is applying, is that Legault is cutting funding and cutting services to the Anglophones in his province, and Ford was cutting services and education to the people, the Francophones, inside of Ontario. They're almost the same amount of number, pretty damn close, where it's not, not much a significant difference between the two. One's acceptable, the other is not. I mean, Legault was pretty much not backing down. He was saying, you take us to court. You're going to lose. You, you're definitely going to lose, you English-speaking people, people. Ford ended up uh, rolling this back because he was getting some protests. He was rolling it back because he had Legault come to him and say, that's not fair. I think that Ford should reciprocate. I think Doug Ford should go over to Quebec or get, get Francois Legault on the phone and tell him, you need to reverse this now because then what you're doing is no different what I try to do and you came back to me because of this. So it's just an example, more examples of Quebec. Uh, it's more examples of the double standards that are available in both Quebec and the double standards that are available inside of, of the rest of Canada. Now, we've got this idea where there is, all over Alberta right now, we have separation. That is really something that is starting to take off now. There's a lot of people out there that are starting to say that Alberta should separate from the rest of Canada. And I can't say I really blame them for having this sentiment because Alberta, especially under the Trudeau government, has just been treaded on. They're not really represented much when it comes to the House of Commons. They have their Alberta MPs, don't get me wrong, but uh, Trudeau has been willing to th trample all over of what Alberta wants. And this is also some of the problems that I have with Trudeau is the fact that he really is representing himself and the people who would vote for him, such as the, the Quebecers, but he's not going, trying, even trying to represent the rest of Canada. He has this idea that anybody who's not with them in Canada is his enemy which is not a sentiment you should have when you're the leader of the country. He, he talks constantly about conservatives, right-wingers, trying to be divisive and divide the country when this is what he's done time and time again. Now, the big thing for Alberta is one of the main reasons I know of is not just this idea that they're getting trampled on, but it has to do with how much they pay into the equalization payments. So Alberta actually pays the most out of any province inside of Canada or territory they pay the most when it comes to equalization payments. So they make all the money, and then they have to give it away. I mean, it's a very socialist thing to do, these equalization payments. And it's not like it's going, much of it is going to the Maritimes. It's not going to PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland. It's all going into Quebec. 
Quebec has taken more than 50% of the equalization payments since they began in 1967, I want to say. I believe it's somewhere in the late 1960s when the equalization payments started up. So they've been doing this time and time again. Now, it's one thing in the past, if Alberta was paying in these equalization payments, if they had money left over for themselves. I mean, that at least would simmer the idea of separatism. That would simmer the, uh, the rage against equalization payments. But now that's all changed. Because as we've seen the oil prices dropping, as we see that each pipeline has been getting canned, as we see that these people who work at Fort McMurray in the tar sands who are there working hard they work really freaking hard man in order to give money back to their to give money back to their families these jobs are disappearing and there's not much left out for them their money's disappearing their jobs are disappearing and they're still giving mi millions every single billions every single year to Quebec so that way Quebec can have a high standard of living while they don't actually do anything for Alberta they don't do anything for the rest of the western Canada and on top of this, there's this, they've had the carbon tax implemented in Alberta by Rachel Notley. They're not against that, but even if they vote Ra uh, Rachel Notley out and someone like Jason Kenney comes in, now we have the Trudeau government that's saying he's going to force the carbon tax on top of them. I, a while ago, ended up showing how, I think it was in my, my video about the carbon tax, I ended up showing how um, there was a business owner in Fort McMurray and she ended up uh, putting out her bill. I was actually on Facebook. She was putting out her her energy bill. And on that, the carbon tax was almost as much as... It was about... Uh, she paid about $794, if I'm remembering correctly, when it came to her service fee, when just, just in order to get the gas there. That's not even talking about how much she paid when it came to the actual gas itself. But then on top of that, her carbon tax was something like $760. It was just a little bit shy of the service tax that she had to pay because just to get the, uh, the gas and the fuel shipped to her in order to heat her restaurant. I, I'm pretty sure it was a restaurant anyway. But it's showing how this idea that the carbon tax is just a few dollars every month, that's all it is, just, just a few dollars every month is nothing more than that. So this is why Quebec, uh, this is why Alberta is having this rising sentiment when it comes to separation. The thing is, though, is there's some problems that they have if they want to separate. Alberta would be landlocked. They don't, they, they would have to go through Canada in order to actually try and ship their oil to the global market. This is something that would actually be the most profitable way to do it. Sure, they're connected to the U.S. and they can make some, they should make some deals with the U.S. government or the states down there, the individual states. They can make some deal to have their oil shipped down there. But what's really going to get them the money is being able to get it over to the coast and then shipped off to other countries that would want to buy their oil. This is something I think is going to become much more difficult. Now, going out, definitely it would seem impractical for them to go out eastwards. They would have to go through uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ke uh, Ontario, Quebec, and then they would have to go through one of the maritime provinces, something like Newfoundland, in order just to get it to the get it out to sea where they could load it up on tankers and then ship it out somewhere to somewhere like Europe. Africa, maybe. It would be more it would be easier for them to go westward and try and get it out to uh, get it out to our western coast in order to ship it out. The thing is with that though, especially right now, is they would have to go through uh, BC, and BC right now is owned by uh, Horgan. Horgan is the premier. It's got the NDP and a Green coalition that's working together in order to form the government, and they are not in favor of the idea of oil being shipped out on the west coast. In fact, this is also some of the problems with his um, Trudeau's oil tanker memorandum. This is the new bill he's coming in, which is going to significantly limit the ability of the uh, of being able to ship our oil on oil tankers out from the western coast. This was going. He was doing this to appease Horgan, to appease the people in BC. So they wouldn't. 
going out west wouldn't work very well for them. They are in a serious trouble right now. What they would need is they would either have to go out east because I believe the oil tanker memorandum is almost specifically dedicated to the west coast. I'm pretty sure it was. So that wouldn't be very practical. They would have to go out towards the east in order to do this, or they would have to ship it down to the U.S. and then export it from the U.S., which, again, doing so would probably give more revenue back to the Americans rather than them being able to just pocket it all. And they might, they'll have their own problems. I mean, individual individual states might not agree with this. I mean, if we're to, they probably go again on the West Coast, and you've got California, you've got uh, Washington State. These are two that are not in favor of, of oil being shipped out. These are blue states, democratic states. That's actually the problem that we have right now is that the dem is at least in America, the democratic states are all along the coastline, whether that's the East Coast or the West Coast. That's where the main, that's where the main vein of Democrats are located. California being probably the most well-known stronghold when it comes to the Democrats. They, they win there by huge numbers time and time and time again. So they have to, Alberta would have to overcome this problem. The thing is, too, is Alberta, aside for the oil, doesn't have much in the way of trade or natural resources in order to do. I think I've heard maybe wheat would be another one that they have out there that they could they, uh, that they could trade, but their main their main source of income has always been their oil. And when you have so much opposition to it, I, I'm worried that it wouldn't actually work out that the way they want it, and then they would be in a real shit show. If this was the case, and they separated, and then they're not able to ship their oil out there, what are they going to do? Because right now, it would probably be the same sort of thing that they wouldn't, Canada wouldn't really be taking their oil, despite the fact we import millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of oil every single month from places like Saudi Arabia, a place we're having a spat with right now. There's no point from coming from these pieces of shit country like Saudi Arabia. Fuck Saudi Arabia. In fact, I even made a video that was called Fuck Saudi Arabia. So <laughs> there's no point in uh, no point in taking the oil from them, especially because we've already had our problems with them. We called them out on the jail, jailing of, uh, I forget the guy's name. The, someone they had in jail, I really, Rafe, Rafe something. And then since then, we've had a few other spats with them, which not going well. But for some reason, we're still shipping them armored vehicles so they can continue their war in Yemen. Their genocidal war. I mean, we have they are going after families in Yemen, not just the government. This is not a country that we should be allied with, if you ask me, which is also one of the downfalls that I find that Donald Trump is doing, is the fact that he's... He's still allied with Saudi Arabia. He still supports Saudi Arabia when he shouldn't. Saudi Arabia is, and the House of Saud are one of these people, one of these groups of people that are working in order to control our world right now. That's what they want. The House of Saud works for themselves. That's it. And uh, one day I'm going to get into them. Talk, I'm going to get into more about them when I talk about... Um, where I talk about how they're trying to manipulate other world governments and through their huge amount of money that they have in order to try and gain control over big parts of the world. Um, I think I've pretty much more or less said my piece when it comes to Alberta. I understand why they're having these sentiments. I don't think separation would go as well for them as they hope simply because of that. We'll have to see what the outcome is going to be. And I think the big difference, though, when it comes to Quebec separatism and Alberta separatism is that Alberta has stuck by Canada for a long time. Quebec, from the get-go, has liked to separate themselves from the rest of Canada while taking the benefits that Canada offers them and still wanting all this special treatments because of it. So I think that's the main separate, the main difference between them is that Alberta's just been getting more and more pissed off that they're to this point when and then Quebec has just always been more or less against Canadians more against Canada itself they're still pissed off for the war that ended up happening um when they lost when it was we were having this battle in Canada against them where they and the final battle that really 
sealed the outcome was the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. All right, so I think that's more or less... Uh, oh, yes, one last thing talking about uh, Quebec separatism is I came across this. This article from Rabble.ca, and Rabble is a progressive news source, but they say, who's behind the social media campaign calling for Alberta separation? And who do you think it's going to be? Ah, yes, of course, Russian bots, and maybe even uh, some Chinese bots, as they're saying about this. You can't rule out Russian bots entirely or Chinese ones. For good or ill, the government in Canada has managed of late to seriously annoy the leaders of these two powerful states. <laughs> the, uh, they Apparently, the progressives just don't fucking care about the public opinion over there in Alberta. Uh, and it's funny just how it's always, always going to the Russian bots. That's always the main thing right now. It, when something bad happens, you can guarantee it's Russian bots. And, I mean... Sure, there are Russian bots out there, there are Chinese bots out there, but they're not as effective as people would think they are. Maybe the Chinese ones. Chinese can actually be some pretty good hackers. But, uh, like, they just have no problem labeling anybody a Russian, a Russian bot. And for those who ended up seeing the work that I did with Bold Like a Leopard, where we were tracking down uh, John Mattis... Uh, the individual reporter who was starting to, who was really helped fuel this, he helped fuel this idea of Russian bots hacking the, hacking the U.S. election. We ended up showing how some of the people he labeled as Russian bots were Americans, and we even spoke to one of them who was an ex-military Navy veteran who got labeled a Russian bot by this guy. And then there was also the propaganda piece behind him and the bullshit that he was peddling because of it. So I just, I'm very, whenever someone just brings up the idea of a Russian bot, I just, I kind of tune out these days. I'm not saying that they're necessarily wrong, but it's just such an easy way to just, just slander somebody. That's it. All right. So let's get in talking about the UN Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, this agenda has been, it's been given the revamp over time. Originally, it was called Agenda 21, and then most of, the, uh, most of what was inside Agenda 2030 has been outlined inside Agenda 21, but then they revamped it and actually officially named it Agenda 2030. And this has been, many people have considered a lot of conspiracy theorists, if you want to call that. I'm sure some people would label me a conspiracy theorist. They have pretty much show, said that this is the blueprint for the new world order, the blueprint for the UN takeover of the world. And they're not exactly wrong when they say that. It's the, the idea of the UN Agenda 2030 is in order to try and limit a country's sovereignty, try and limit their ability to survive on their own and have a say over what goes on inside of their country. And in doing so, you've you've taken a lot of control from these uh, from these countries. Now you've now gotten control over their borders. You've gotten control over their monetary system. Things such as this. This is exactly what the idea of is. And we're not going to go through all 17 goals. I've written down a few that I do want to cover, which I think are some of the main ones when it comes to this. When it comes to Agenda 2030. Now, this agenda has gone back for years, actually. Well, the whole idea of it was, uh, the whole idea, actually, you, you can originally try to trace it back to something around the 80s or so, maybe a little bit earlier in the 70s. This is where the idea was really starting to sprout up. But I believe it was around 2012 or so. Around 2012, when the official more modern day Agenda 2030 came in, and it's gotten a revamp, I believe, in 2015 as well, is uh, also another time when it ended up having some new stuff added into it. But anyway, as we you look through what the what the sustainable developments say, it becomes very concerning once you read between the lines, because what they want to do 
is, depending on what we're talking about, is gain control over what you, what authority the people have in their own country. And this is exactly where both the Paris Climate Agreement and where the Compact for Migration came from. And for those who don't know, there is also a global compact for, uh, there's a compact for refugees now too. So this is sort of, it shows the ridiculousness of the counter protesters when they're talking about, uh, they were talking about the global compact for migration, such as what we saw in Ottawa and we saw all around when they, again, during last week's protest on the Hill. It was saying that we had the counter protesters saying like, uh, no hate, no fear, refugees are welcome here. That was the chant that they were chanting. And the thing is about that is that, the, as we were, we were saying, the people were protesting it and were saying it had nothing to do with refugees. It had everything to do with immigration. And this is something that people who are in favor of the Global Compact for Migration have been bringing up, along with their its non-binding arguments. They've been bringing up this idea that it's, it's for to help refugees, you know, give them a little more support, make sure they're a little safer. No. It was two different things. There was the Compact for Migration and there was the Compact for Refugees. So that just put to bed their whole argument right there. And this is where it came from. The Global Compact for Migration. It gives control over our borders to the UN. When we're talking about the Paris Climate Agreement, it's limiting your ability to use fossil fuels, limiting your ability to survive on your own, and it's going to actually help turn the Western world, these profitable worlds, into more of a second or third world, uh, third world countries. This is the goal. You keep everybody down. See, the problem right now is that when you move these gov these countries into more of a second or third world uh, status, then they're easier to control. They'll be easier to control because everybody we you'll have rising crime, you'll have resources that are more scarce, and it gives the, lo the local governments more authority to assert themselves as in, well, you know, crime is really at an all-time high. We need a crackdown. People are starting to get really pissed off on the streets. Well, maybe we need to limit the ability for uh, freedom of assembly. It will infringe on your rights. It goes farther than just take your borders, take your ability to pay for your uh, their ability to drive your car or heat your home. It's The whole point of it is to bring about an actual Marxist government through the U.N., into uh, every individual nations. In fact, this is something that has even been stated by um, uh, Maurice Strong. Maurice Strong has been the architect of the Paris Climate Agreement. And sometime soon, I'm having a guest on where we are going to be discussing Maurice Strong. And that'll be another episode of Know Your Owners because Maurice Strong has been... I, I don't even know the full extent of this yet, but my guest is really intelligent and really well-educated on this subject. We're just sort of planning things out right now. He's going to come on. We're going to talk about this, and you're going to see how Maurice Strong has had his tentacles into absolutely everything, including the UN. And one thing that he has said about the UN is that the UN can be used in order to undermine the sovereignty of a nation and to bring about a socialist Marxist government inside of that nation. So let's get into the actual uh, Agenda 2030, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals right now. So we'll start with uh, I had one and two I wanted to cover. So number one. End poverty in all its forms everywhere. And number two was end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. So this is what they end up talking about. But how do you remove poverty? How do you end hunger? This has been something that people have been talking about for decades now, that this is what we want. We want world peace. We want to end all homelessness, end all hunger. Well, the first thing is first, you got to start at home. But this is not what they're going to be doing. We have a number of, here in Canada and America, we have huge amounts of, oh, sorry, just want to check something. We have huge amounts of homeless people right now on our streets, but they're trying to take this global. They're trying to go talk about places in Africa and Southeast Asia and the Middle East, and this is where we're going to do it. Well, how do you do this? You do this by um, transferring the wealth from one country to another. This is exactly what this is making reference to. You can guarantee that. So it's going to be us, Canada, America, a bunch of these other rich Western worlds that are going to be paying into this. 
This is why that we have so many countries that are starting to get dissolution with the UN, especially as populist governments are popping up. I mean, the amount of countries that ended up going against the Global Compact for Migration were populist countries that could see the writing on the wall, and that's why they got out. But the globalist governments, they're the ones that are pushing for this. People like Justin Trudeau, Theresa May, uh, Angela Merkel, um, Emmanuel Macron. These are some of the biggest players when it comes to this plan to be put in place right now. And this is why all over the world, you're seeing their, you're seeing these citizens revolt against them. You had Theresa May, who just barely, by the skin of her teeth, survived a no, vote of non-confidence. We have generals, people in the military, over in France that are saying Macron is a traitor, and they're trying to implement something. I think there may have even been something about a vote of no confidence against him too, but don't quote me on that. I can't really remember. So how do you end world, uh, world hunger? You transfer wealth and resources to those poor countries, places like Africa places like the Middle East, Asia. That's how you're going to do it. But the problem with that too is look how big of a population that live in poverty and that live on a few dollars a day. It's in the billions, not millions, not hundreds of millions, billions. So how are you going to achieve this short of bankrupting the Western countries, the countries with the wealth? You can't. But if you bankrupt those wealthy countries by uh, by pursuing this goal, well, the UN will help uh, by doing so. They're solidifying what is socialist dogma into these countries. But then the people who have the freedom of mobility, the freedom of expression in these countries are going to see that come to a clampdown. When you don't have the wealth in order to buy a car, freely move around, you're going to see that many of your rights are going to get eroded as a byproduct of these of these um, of this plan that's being put in place. And don't get me wrong, I'm not just saying that. Well, you know, we're going to transfer wealth to end hunger, and then boom, all your rights are gone. But it's going to leave when you break the people down in these countries, the people who have stood up to have their personal freedoms, you're going to see that when you take away their wealth, take away their mobility, just barely scraping by, it will demoralize them. It will beat them down. Just life is going to beat them down, and then they're easier to take over. This is where I'm going with this. Uh, number four, Ensure inclusive and equitable quality of education, promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. Now, the reason I bring this up is mostly to do with, if you remember the tweet that Justin Trudeau put out uh, maybe about two weeks ago now to Trevor Noah, where he was saying, oh, you know what? Well, thanks, Trevor Noah. How about we we send $50 million overseas to in order for young girls and women in order to get an education? Well... This is exactly what's going on with the agenda. This is exactly what's calling for in the 2030 agenda. You're sending your wealth overseas. Now, on top of that, there's a few other problems. One of the problems is in is that foreign aid such as this, it's almost never worked because they don't go into the countries. They don't distribute it among the civilians. They give it to the governments. They give it to the dictator of those countries. And when they do this, what ends up happening is that they rely on those local governments in order to distribute the wealth the way it's supposed to be. If it's for education for young girls, they're saying, okay, here you go, whoever you want, you know? Here you go, Saudi Arabia, probably not them, but, you know, one of these Middle Eastern countries. We're going to use them as an example. You send, these mon you send the money there to these corrupt governments who don't even hold the same values as you do, and you expect them to distribute the money properly. That's not what ends up happening. The money disappears. Nothing changes in that country, especially if it's a country such as many countries in the Middle East that treat women as second-class citizens. You really think that they're going to listen to you and say, well, you say you're giving us money in order to give, uh, you're going to give us money in order to have more women educated? Yes, we're going to get right on that. No, they're going to take the money and say, see you later, sucker. Uh, number five, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. This goes back to number four and what I've said about number four already. Number six, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. 
All right. Well, first of all, this concerns me mostly because of Canada. We have some of the largest amounts of water on the planet. Fresh water, I'm talking about. That's one thing that makes Canada unique, and one reason I want to protect Canada's water supply. But this has been getting sold out time and time again. It's been given to the Chinese. It's been given to, I know the Americans have some control over our water supply. So when you're giving this out to other countries, and I believe it was under Harper, if I'm, I'm trying to remember correctly, it's been a few years since I've actually looked into this or remember hearing about it. I believe Harper gave some control of our water supply over to the Chinese, actually. So, oh, and just to be clear while we're on Harper, Harper was the one who established this in, uh, in Canada. He signed Canada on to the UN Agenda 2030, and Justin Trudeau is going on to work uh, to implement this plan. Which is one thing why I have reservations about some of our other politicians out there and whether they're going to actually do something to fight back against this plan. I don't believe they will. So, the management of the water and sanitation for all means that your water supply is going to start getting shipped all over the world to countries that need them. I mean, just in South Africa, at the big, I think it was around the beginning of this year, they were believed that they were going to run out of water. Something had to be done. Well, in future, and this is also why when we talk about climate change, they're talking about, well, you know, droughts are going to take over and water supplies are going to disappear. They're going to take control of your water supply. But this goes even farther than this. And I believe maybe one of these other um, goals in here might cover it as well. But what they're going to do, I believe one of the goals talks about fisheries. These goals are going to, these goals are going to um, take control of both the fish, uh, fishing activity that we can do, but more importantly, the minerals that are underneath the water supply. So any oil that's down there, or any sort of, um, you know, if we if we go in and we find out that there's a large uh, supply of, name of uh, precious metal, that's underneath the water, this is going to come more in control of the global economy, of the, of the UN, than it will by the, by the respected country, even if it's along your water line. Because you have a certain amount of, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how far it goes, but you got a certain amount of area that's out off your your coast that is considered uh, that is considered domestic um, domestic waters. So that is Canada's water. So that's America's water. And then you get out into international waters. They're going to take control of your domestic water and, and the minerals that are underneath and the fish that are inside uh, that are inside of your uh, inside of your domestic waters. We already see, as I spoke a little bit earlier, we already see the problems when it comes to uh, being over in the Maritimes and how the government is starting to implement more regulation when it comes to fisheries. So many of these fishermen who live in Newfoundland, PEI, and all these other ones who make their living when it comes to fishing are going to see their profits taken away because of this. Number 10. Reduce inequality within and among countries. Well, the, this one I see more of a problem when it actually comes to... Uh, this one is more of a problem when it actually comes to how you're going to get it done. Because when you have inequalities in Middle Eastern countries where women are forced to put on the veils, how are you going to enforce them in order to, to actually agree to this, to actually go along with this. And I see as a possibility that if this was become more extreme, that going into a country and forcing them to be this way would be one such method of doing so. And those never work out. Whenever somewhere like America has gone into another country and tried to force that culture to change, it's never worked out. Iraq is the most ex uh, closest example. Do you remember a few years ago, Iraq was having its first democratic election? Where's Iraq now? It's a complete fucking mess. This uh, this ended up taking place in Iran too in the nineteen, I think it was the nineteen seventy two um, revolution when the Iranian regime to retook power. You see the pictures before that where you know women were in jeans, they had their hair out, and they were just going around. They could, but then that ended up getting taken over, and then they went back to the culture that they were so accustomed to. They went back to putting hijabs and putting veils over their women 
So you're not really going to see this play out, this idea of inequality within and among countries. And this is m way they're going to try this is more of your money, more of your resources being shipped out in order to try and persuade these countries to reduce inequality. It's not going to work out nearly as well as they want. That was number 10. So number 11. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. How do you do this? You do it through control. And that control and surveillance as well. So we're talking about cities that will be set up with cameras all over the place. A lot of the way that China is right now. They have surveillance all over their, uh, all over the major cities over there. Some of them even have microphones that are set up. Now... I remember a while ago that uh, I ended up getting one of my subscribers a commented section when I was talking about the dangers when it comes to uh, having those gunshot microphones, and I was saying, well, maybe you can pick up on on the the chatter that average citizens are doing, and they ended up correcting me and saying that, well, no, you know, these are actually useful. These are not; they're too high up, and they're not; uh, they won't work when it comes to chatter. He actually it was a subscriber who comments a lot, and he's very knowledgeable but i'm not talking about those sort of microphones i'm talking about actual microphones that are used in order for surveillance and it goes even farther than that china right now what they're doing is they have an, a, a software which can take facial recognition of the people that's there and in fact it's so effective that there was one i think it was a reporter or someone someone I'm trying to remember the exact article that I saw, but he had worked something out with the Chinese government to check out and see how effective it was. So he one day just showed up in China, didn't tell him when, didn't tell him where, but they were going to use their surveillance equipment and facial recognition in order to identify him. Took him 20 minutes. Didn't tell him when they was coming, didn't tell him where, took him 20 minutes of being in China before he was identified by the Chinese authorities, which shows how effective this surveillance technology is. It has the ability to recognize some... 3 billion faces in about a minute or so. So you can expect this sort of surveillance when they're talking about making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, which is also one of the reasons I think that uh, the mass migration plays into it. Because when you put, you're bringing all these people in that are settling inside of the cities, because that's where they end up going. Not only are you changing the voting demographics, you're also going to start creating little conflicts inside of between the different groups of people. And then that'll give them, once the violence really breaks out, it will give them a reason to implement this sort of security. This is the point of it. So, and you can also expect, because another thing that's in China right now has to do with the, uh, the social credit system that they give out. So, it's been, uh, there's a few different good if not documentaries, interviews out there and show how it works. But the way the citizens work, the better they are uh, they consider of a citizen, the more benefits they get. And the less, the more problematic, let's say, of a citizen they are, the less benefits they get. And one way is this is that one Chinese national who gave an interview, and if I can find it again, I'll link it in the description, but he ended up showing how Things such as his ability to buy a train ticket or buy, uh, or buy a plane ticket to travel was limited simply because he was seen as a problem amongst the Chinese authorities. So I believe that this is the sort of system they're going to try and put in place in countries all over the world. Uh, number 13. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. So we're talking taxes. We're talking about limitations on your resources. And a perfect way uh, that we can describe this is smart meters. They're already been put in place to monitor how much you use your gas, use your, your water, use your electricity, including peak hours that they have. That uh, So you can't, if you use, run your washing machine, run your dishwasher at a certain time of day, they're going to charge you more about uh, more on this. And like I said earlier, when I was talking about Maurice Strong, this was climate change and the Paris Climate Agreements was one of his main things that he was involved in. Uh, as, as my guest who's going to be coming on at some point stated, it was his baby, the Paris Climate Agreements. So, whether climate change is real or not is not the question here. What is the question here or what is the re reason behind this is you're going to see that 
this is going to be used to limit your access to resources. It's going to be used to limit your freedom of mobility. You notice how a lot of politicians these days are pushing for you to get off of using your car? Use public transportation. Walk everywhere. Bike everywhere. You notice this? Also, a lot of climate alarmists are doing this, and we know now that these climate alarmists are actually some of the biggest polluters out there. They don't recycle nearly as much. They take transportation, which is wasteful. Private jets are one of the biggest wasteful ones. Al Gore is a multimillionaire because of this. So is David Suzuki. So these are some of the problems that we're having, and they're going to use this idea of a a climate change doomsday in order to push you in this direction because the latest prophecy is saying we need to uh it just came out from the ipcc that's uh that stated that you need to uh you need to we need to lower our global emissions to one uh 1.5 degrees celsius by 2030 or we're too far gone well there's that that fucking year again 2030, Agenda 2030, and they've been moving the goalpost on this time and time again. I mean, there's an Associated Press article that came out in 1989 that states that uh, that states that by the year 2000, climate change is going to be too far gone. It's going to kill all of humanity. Then we had Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth came out. He said, what, by 2015? that Florida was supposed to be underwater due to melting ice glaciers and rising sea levels and about something around half to uh, one third to half of the world population is going to be displaced because they live along coastlines and rising sea levels are going to do it. Have you seen any of this take place? No. So they're doing this. And then now once again, they're to bring in in this doomsday by 2030, we're all going to be dead. Every single one of us. And then we have someone like the CBC who has actually put out about how Western world, pe uh, the people in the Western world need to limit the amount of children that they're having because the more chil more people we have on this planet, the more children that we have, the more the climate change ends up uh, taking place. But then at the same time, they want to they want to support mass migration of people who have children what, four, five, six, sometimes more children and bring them over to the West, which is just by proxy going to raise our global emissions by their own definition. So it just gets ridiculous and more ridiculous. Number 14. Conserve and sustainably use the ocean seas uh, marine resources for sustainable development. So this goes back to what I was talking about, about con uh, controlling the fish, uh, the fish in the ocean, controlling the minerals that are underneath the water itself. Uh, this might even, in some ways, limit transportation, such as uh, if you want to take a cruise or something across the ocean, because it may provide more global emissions for you stuff like this this is what it's playing into so i'm not going to stay on here just because i've already covered it when i was talking about the water supplies earlier and number 17 strengthen the means of implementation and revitalization of the global partnership for sustainable development one world government translated that's that number 17 just says it all right there bring all of these all the resources, bring everything that they've been talking about through the other sustainable goals, bring it under the control of the UN, of this, they want to implement a one world government, essentially. I'm not trying to sound like too out there for you guys, but this is exactly what the UN has been trying to do, because the UN has been a perfect way to undermine the Western sovereignty, because the UN, technically everything they do is non-binding. But we see how it has real-world consequences, things such as the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we see how, despite the fact it's non-binding, well, we're constantly having to meet our goals to the Paris Climate Agreement. we got to do it, and it's going to be the same thing with the compact. Oh, we got to meet our compact for migration goals. There are a lot of people need to be resettled. So this is what we're seeing, and they realized. See, this is something that uh, a lot of these people who are working behind the scenes to manipulate the way that our politics works, they realize something about the UN. It doesn't matter whether you are a country that has 2 million uh, people in your population or you're someplace like America that has 300 million people in your population. You get one vote and you affect the same outcome. Now, granted, there are vetoes for certain nations inside of uh, the UN, but they realize that 
nations such as the Congo has as much pull in the UN as the US does. Even though the US is uh, even though the US is a bigger country, even though the US has more wealth to it, it it doesn't matter. This is why the UN is used to undermine the sovereignty of a nation and they can do so, especially when it comes to something like migration. What they're doing is they're spreading their problems to these Western worlds. That's exactly the point of it. Because if you have a large population and you're going to have famine or you have water shortages, well, send these people off to the Western world and they can deal with these problems now. If you have, just name it. Name the problem that they have. If you don't have enough resources, well, send them to another place and then they can spend their resources caring for these people. This is exactly what we're seeing right now um, especially when it comes to these border crossers, is that they're now, they came over here, and now we're spending over a billion dollars dealing with these border crossers because of it. Uh, the ones at Roxham Road is what I'm talking about. So, this is the idea of the UN Agenda 2030, is that it's going, everything you hold dear, everything we hold dear, all your personal rights, all your personal freedoms are going to be undermined by this agenda and by the UN. This is not the point of why the UN got started, I don't believe, but this is what it has become. Why is it that so many countries that have abusive human rights records are sitting on the, are sitting on the UN um, Human Rights Council? I mean, some of the worst countries with the worst track records are sitting on the Human Rights Council. This is because... The UN, the UN has been hijacked. It's not for what it was supposed to be about. The UN, which has its roots in the League of Nations, was started after, if I'm remembering correctly, World War I, after they just saw one of the most devastating conflicts in the world. This was, uh, so they were supposed to become together and prevent these sort of problems happening again. But then down the line, people like Maurice Strong started to see that they could manipulate these nations. They can manipulate what the UN is about in order to, in order to further their personal agendas. Many of these people that we're talking about are far left-wing Marxists. That's who they are. They're socialists, communists, and these people have now taken over the UN, and it's a perfect way to spread this ideology. And in fact, even when we're talking about the idea of education. I believe this is also the point to it. I believe that the point of the spreading the education is we already see how indoctrinated the Western universities are. Now they're going to indoctrinate universities and schools all over the world, and it's getting younger and younger. So this is where we're going, and this is why it's important for people to understand the UN, global, uh, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030. And if you want, what I'm going to do is below this video, in the description... I'm going to post this. Oh, wait. There you go. You can see it now. Agenda 2030 Translator, how they read the UN's new sustainable development goals. So through this article, it just breaks all 17 points, all 17 goals down to their most basic of what they're saying and what it means for you. So you can go on and read this. It's not very long, so you, it won't take you long to do this. So I'm going to post this in the description, and when I do, you all can take a read through, see what the agenda is really about, and then there's people out there who have even talked about it better than I have about the problems facing us through the, uh, through the UN Agenda 2030 and what they're trying to actually implement here. But anyway, I think that's it for me. I want to thank you all for joining me here today. And uh, I'll be back soon with uh, talking more about this. And I'll have my guests on soon. I don't want to reveal anything yet just because nothing is solid yet. But if we do, it's going to be great. He's also, he's given me a lot of information to read through. So it's going to be good. And I'm hoping, I know I've already said this a couple times, but uh, I should be able in the next few weeks to get at least one more episode of Know Your Owners out. And I should be able to get out part two of Foreign Money which is the first one was talking about the money that was going against tar sands by people such as the Rockefellers and George Soros as they are limiting, using environmental groups to limit the supply of, of oil, Canadian oil available while they're buying into other oil sources that would then are making them a profit. 
So the next one I'm going to hope to have out is about lead now. The uh, everyone knows lead now. And if you don't, then it'll be very, very educational for you. But anyway, I'm going to get those done soon and get them out to you within the next few weeks or so. And thank you all for joining me today. I'm Adrian Lloyd. This is just my stupid opinion. And go subscribe to my new Twitter account.